Hi, my name is Mark Riggins, and I'm pastor here at Life Point, located in Plano, Texas, and we meet here every Sunday at 1030, and we are here for your family. I hope today's message is an encouragement to you. Truly, some of these women who come into Emily's place are in impossible situations, but due to our partnership, we've helped them go from the impossible to the possible. And today, I wanna talk and teach us about how to pray the impossible prayer. You may be sitting here and you may be thinking, well, Pastor George, what is the impossible prayer? Well, it is different from a normal prayer. A normal prayer goes something like this. God, I need your help, give me strength. God, I need your help, give me wisdom. God, give me, uh, I need your help, give me resources. You and I pray normal prayers all the time. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with normal prayers, okay? Impossible praying, on the other hand, are prayers when you have a crisis in your life that is out of your control. It is where you can't do anything about it. It is unknowable and it is uncontrollable. The principles I'm going to teach you today have changed my life in the past and they are changing my life today because Cheryl and I, with her having long haul COVID and being in bed rest for months, we're praying this prayer. Now, one of the elements of this prayer is actually thanking God in advance. So let me explain this. Let's say this past Thanksgiving, I called you up and I said, I'm going to pay your next 12 months of mortgage payments on your house and the check is in the mail. How would you respond to that? Would you wait until you got the check and it cleared? Or would you thank me right then? Now I know some of you, you like to hassle me and you say, I'd wait till the check got cleared. But normally you would think for a moment, says, you know, Pastor George is a pretty good guy. He's honest, he's retired now, but he's a man of integrity. And you would just respond, thank you so much. Folks, this is what God wants us to do in prayer. And one of the five elements of the impossible prayer is thanking God in advance. And why is that? Because It takes faith when you are in in an impossible situation. And Jesus talks about the importance of faith in Mark chapter 11, verse 24. He said this, anytime you ask for anything in prayer, believe that you have received it and you will receive it. Notice the change of tense. He says, believe that you have received it, past tense, and you will receive it future tense. Anytime you ask for anything in prayer, believe that you have received it. Wait a minute, Pastor George. Do you mean I have to believe that I have it in order to get it? Yes. It's called faith. Are you saying I've got to believe it's so even though it isn't so right now so that it will be so? Absolutely, that's exactly what what I'm saying. It's faith. You see, this past Thanksgiving, my guess is as you gathered around the table with family and friends, a lot of Thanksgiving was being offered up. But what it was, was gratitude for how God had blessed you this past year. There is a difference between gratitude and faith. Will you write this down? I want you to take some good notes because you may not be in an impossible situation right now, but I guarantee you sometime in your future, you will be. Write this down. Thanking God after you've received something is gratitude. Thanking God before you receive it is called faith. In an impossible situation, you need faith and not just gratitude. You need this attitude while you are waiting on God's timing. And this attitude is not an attitude of begging God. Oh God, please, please, please answer this prayer. 
uh, with sugar and candy on top of it. No, it is having an attitude of thankfulness for what he has promised until it arrives. That's faith. Abraham had this kind of faith. God told him that he was going to have a son and be the father of many nations. And you know how many years he thanked God before that prayer was answered? 25 years. That's a lot of thanking God in advance for a promise that he fulfilled. Isaac, the miracle baby. When I started LifePoint 32 years ago, I used to walk at Custer and Hedgecoke's. That's where the end of the world was at in this area. It was just land. And the first year that I was there, every Sunday I would come to that spot and I would pray, God, give us some land. After that first year, the next six years, I thanked God for the land that he, was, that he gave us, even though we hadn't gotten it yet. And when I was praying, I wasn't begging God. I knew, God, you somewhere around this place, you're gonna give us five to 15 acres. I don't know where, but you do, and I wanna thank you right now. Guess what? We're in that situation again, aren't we? We're gonna be here, but we're gonna be there, wherever that there is at. And it just reminds me of the old days of faith and thanking God in advance because he knows. Now, one of the best examples of this, this impossible prayer, is in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It is a story about an Israel king, King Jehoshaphat, who is surrounded by three enemies, and he knows that he is going to get creamed. And he prays. What I'm going to teach you, folks, I guarantee you, you can use today or tomorrow. I don't know what you're going through, what impossible situation that you're facing, whether it's organizationally, Mark, or whether it's personal. You may be in an uncontrollable situation financially or maybe in your marriage, or maybe you have a rogue kid. Whatever is not controllable by you, this is the prayer that you need to pray. Now, I wanna set this up before the prayer. Let's read these first five verses out of Second Chronicles 20. After this, three enemy nations united to attack King Jehoshaphat. Spies told him, a huge combined army is marching to Jerusalem right now to defeat you. Scared and worried, King Jehoshaphat resolved to seek the Lord and he announced a nationwide fast. Does that sound kind of familiar? These last several weeks, Pastor Mark has been asking us to pray at noon and we have been. And fasting for our own lives but for our church. And he announced a nationwide fast. So everyone came together to fast and pray and seek help from God. When they all got to the temple in Jerusalem, the king stood up and prayed aloud. And then the prayer is gonna begin to start. But I want you to notice some things. Write these beside, somewhere in the the side of that scripture. King Jehoshaphat does three very important things here. The first thing he does is he prays personally. It says that he resolved to seek the Lord. He goes directly to God and resolves to seek the Lord. He made prayer the first priority and not the last resort. Far too often, we do just the opposite, don't we? We're in some uncontrollable situation. We try this and we try that and we try this over here until finally we come to the end of our rope and we think, well, I guess all we can do now is pray and we don't wanna mess that prayer up, so let's call the pastor in, right? And let's have him pray the perfect prayer. No, he prays privately. And then secondly, he enlists the support of other people. Why is that? Because there is power in group prayer. That's what Pastor Mark has been leading us in in these last several months. And you know what's interesting to me is he shared last week. During that period of time, not knowing what was going on in that that charter school, 
Because I believe of our prayers, God gave us the full appraisal price of this building. And we get to be here as we take that money to try to find a there, wherever that there is at. But I know in my heart, God has already picked it out. Now you may be sitting here and you may be thinking, well, Pastor George, why in the world should I be praying for someone else's uncontrollable situation when I've got my own uncontrollable situation? Well, that's real easy. When you take care of other people's causes, guess what? God will take care of your cause. That is why this church over 32 years has lived its life beyond the walls. Let's help these organizations. Let's help them to make a difference in our community because I am convinced as you and I take up other people's causes, God takes up our cause. Interesting to me, Job, he was in one of those uncontrollable situations and it says at the end of the book of Job that he prayed for his friends and God restored his fortunes. I'm praying that God will refresh and restore you as you give attention to others outside yourself. So what are, these, what are the components of an impossible prayer? Well, there are five. Will you write these down? You first start by focusing on God and not your problem. When you are in an uncontrollable situation, it is natural to start by saying, God, I am in this crisis. As if God doesn't know. God knows. He knows you need resources. He knows about your marital problems. He knows about your rogue kid. No, you start by focusing first on God. This is what Jehoshaphat did. And he does four things within focusing on God. The first one is this, write this down. In your prayer, remind yourself of God's greatness. When you first come to God, you acknowledge who he is. God, you are awesome. God, you are faithful. God, you are lovable. God, you are the God of impossibilities. Take a look at what Jehoshaphat did in verse 6, 20, verse 6. O oh Lord, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over every kingdom and nation. You are so powerful and mighty that nothing and no one can defeat you. And so I focus on God's greatness. The second thing you do is you remind yourself of his unlimited power. And the reason that you do that is as you remember how powerful God is, folks, it helps you and I to trust him. Jehoshaphat comes to God and says, God, I remember that you are a miracle worker. Look at verse seven. And God, did you not drive out those who tried to keep us from living here when you brought us back home? What's he talking about here? He's talking about Exodus. He's saying, God, I remember when you gave this land to, to Abraham. I remember when you defeated the Egyptians. I remember when you defeated the, the inhabitants that was in our land. And so you remind yourself of who God is and you remember his power. And then the third thing is this, is that you remind God of his promises. This is a very important key God, didn't you, did you not say that you would help us? God, did you not say that you would care for us? God, did you not say that you would meet all of our needs? There are over 7,000 promises in God's word. And all of them are yes in Christ Jesus. Notice how Jehoshaphat does this in verse seven. And also, did you not give this what land? this promised land, to your friend Abraham's descendants to be theirs forever. God loves to be reminded of the promises that he's given. Just like I like to be reminded of the promises that I tell my grandchildren. 
COVID came along and I didn't get to take my grandkids to Disney World again, but they remind me. Grandpa, when are we gonna get to go back to Disney World again? You promised. And when I hear that, guess what? It warms my heart. And then the fourth thing as you focus on God is you ask God to do the impossible. Take a look at verses 10 through 12. Second Chronicles 20, our enemies want to destroy us. Will you not stop them from defeating us? Notice how real specific he is here. Do you know specifically what you, what you are asking God for in your impossible situation? If you don't, you need to clarify that. Because if you just come to God and say, oh God, just, just bless me, okay? Well, guess what? That could be a trial. And I don't think that's what you're wanting is trial upon trial upon trial. You need to get specific with God. God, I need to get out of debt. God, I need physical healing. That's our prayer. My prayer with Cheryl, with amongst a lot of our friends. Healing God. Need healing in my marriage. You get specific so that when God answers it, folks, you'll know it. And you can be like the leper who went back, the one leper out of 10 that got healed, goes back and gives and expresses thanks, giving for it, gratitude. This is all just in the first step. And I know you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh my goodness, we're gonna be here for the next hour and a half. Take some good notes. You can pray these things. The second thing, that we see Jehoshaphat doing is that he tells God, God, I can't do it. I need you to do this. This is what makes an impossible prayer different from a normal prayer. Let me explain. When you and I come to God and say, God, I need your help. Do you know what you're saying? You're saying that you still think you can do something about it. God, I need your help. Give me wisdom. God, I need your help. Give me resources. God, I need your healing. God, I need your help. Heal me. You're thinking that you have a part. But in, in an impossible prayer, you don't say that. You say, God, I can't possibly do this. It is beyond my control. It is unknowable. This is where Cheryl and I are at with COVID. No one has the slightest idea how to solve un long haul COVID. And as you tell God, God, I can't do it. You express your feelings to him. Cheryl and I have cried together. God, I'm powerless because this is what you see Jehoshaphat doing. Take a look at this, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12. Lord, we are powerless against the mighty army that is coming to attack us, and we don't know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. And so you tell God how you feel. God, I feel powerless. I feel helpless. I feel hopeless. God, I just don't know what to do. Have you ever said that to God? God, I don't have the slightest idea what to do. This is such a mess. I don't know whether I should go up. I should go down. Should I go left? Should I go right? I don't know what to do. When you feel that way, you need to tell God, God, I'm powerless. I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you. I don't need your help. I need you to do this because if it's going to be, I guarantee you, it isn't up to me. God, it's up to you. Now, it's interesting that Jehoshaphat said, that he felt powerless. And yet six verses earlier, he says, you are the God of all power. Now, I want you to think about this. You and I don't need power if we are connected to the God of all power, do we? You and I don't need wisdom when we are connected to the all-knowing God. You and I don't need resources when we are connected to the God of all resources. And during this holiday season, you and I don't have to be everywhere and everything for everybody when you and I are connected to the omnipresent one. 
The question is, how do you get the connection? And I love the worship team's last song. How do you get it? By waiting and trusting. Will you write down this profound thought? It's a simple thought, but it's one that I've rediscovered with long haul COVID. And it is this, sometimes faith does nothing but, but, but being still. Does nothing. At night, every night I put my wife to bed. I get all the pillows around her to help her help her with her uncomfortable body that she has right now. And then we take out a few minutes and we recount gratefully the five things that we were grateful for that day and five things from me. And then I close by praying the impossible prayer. And within a few minutes, Cheryl's asleep and I sit in the room quietly waiting on God and his timing. Notice in verse 13, that all the men of Judah stood before the Lord waiting with their wives and young children and even babies. And these guys with their families weren't waiting just five minutes. No, they were waiting hours. And by waiting hours, what were they communicating? In essence, God, we're looking to you. This is bigger than us. We're at the end of our rope, God, but guess what? We're holding on to you. And who were they doing this with? Their families. You see, the thing that you're going through isn't just about you. It's about the next generation. Whatever impossible situation that you're going through, can I encourage you to invite your family in on it and come together and pray? Just like Pastor Mark and the staff have encouraged us, let's come together. And this is the impossible situation that we're in right now. So that when God answers it, guess whose faith is going to grow? Not just yours, but your kids' faith. And you'll begin building a legacy and a testimony in them. Now there is a third part to this impossible prayer. First, you focus on God. Secondly, you tell God, God, I can't do it. If it's going to be, it's not up to me. It's up to you, God. But the third thing you do is you listen to what God says. Prayer is a conversation and not a monologue. It is not a one-way street. It is a two-way street. And so you spend time listening to God. How do you do that? Through the Bible reading the scriptures. I tell people a lot of times, quit, quit looking for a sign in the sky and start looking for a scripture because God's will is found in God's word. And the more you're in God's word, the more you're gonna understand God's will. Listen to what, as, he, as they just quieted themselves and listen, listen to what God tells them. This is packed full of encouragement. 2 Chronicles 20, 15 and 18. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. You won't need to fight in this battle. Just take up your position and stand strong. Then just wait and watch and you will see the Lord deliver you. Again, do not be afraid or get discouraged because the Lord is with you. Then the king and everyone else all bowed down on the ground and worshiped. Can you imagine that scene? The whole nation comes and they get on their knees. They're humbling themselves before God, all because God said this, I'm gonna handle it, don't sweat it. It's a done deal. When you and I begin to pray that way, where we get on our knees and say, God, if it's going to be, it's not up to me, it's up to you. Guess what? You're gonna hear God say to you the very set four things that he said to them. Will you write these down? The first thing he says to them is this, relax. He says, don't be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. In essence, he's saying, just chill, I've got it. Second thing, he's gonna say, it's my battle, I'll fight it. He says, the battle is not yours, but God's. 
One of the reasons that you and I get so frustrated and fatigued in life is because we're fighting battles that don't belong to our, us. They belong to God. But we fight them because guess what? We think we're God. And we get frustrated and we get fatigued. God says, the battle is mine. I'll solve the problem. And so he'll say to you, relax. It's my battle. The third thing he will say is keep serving in your position. Notice that he says, just take up your position and stand strong. Folks, that takes courage, doesn't it? The enemy is advancing. And God doesn't say to them, just go home and relax. Watch some TV. He doesn't say to them, go run out there on your own and just fight them. And he doesn't say to them, you know, don't do anything. No, he says, get in your position. I don't have time to explain this. But every person in this church has a position to serve in. A non-serving Christian is a contradiction. And as we advance to the there, wherever the there is at, we need to backfill here. And Pastor Mark has challenged us to serve Back at the end of July, with my wife and I fighting this thing called long-haul COVID, Pastor Mark says, I- I'm going to ask you something, and it's big. Pastor George, will you, will you teach an adult Sunday school class? I know all that you're going through in this uncontrollable situation, but would you, would you do that? And I says, I-, I can tell you the answer right now, but I'm going to wait and talk to Cheryl. And when I got home after that breakfast, I said, Cheryl, Pastor Mark has asked me to teach an adult Sunday school class. What do you think? And she says, yes, serve. Because you continue to serve even when you're in situations that are beyond your control. And then the fourth thing is this, you stand and wait and watch what God does. You relax. He tells you, relax. It's my battle. Get in your position. Find the place that you're going to serve at, at life point. And then stand and wait and watch to see what God does. And God begins to unfold this thing. This is a strange battle plan. It says, you won't need to fight in this battle. Just take up your position and stand strong. Then just wait and watch and you will see the Lord deliver you again. Uh, Deliver you. Again, do not be afraid or get discouraged because the Lord is with you. That's a strange battle plan, isn't it? That verse, 2 Chronicles 20, 17, is the middle verse of the Old Testament. little trivia. And in the middle of your impossible battle, God says to you, you don't need to fight it. You can resign from being uh, uh, the general manager of the universe. Get in your position and just start serving and just stand still and watch and see what I do. You see, far too often when we are in impossible situations, what we seek to do is run. (laughs) I'm just gonna run from this. But the problem with running is that generally we find ourselves in a bigger mess later. So I want you to write this down. It's never God's will to run from a difficult situation. Never. Never, 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 never. You never run from a difficult situation. You stand still. And you watch and see what God is going to do. God has never lost a battle in his lifetime. And if you and I will do it God's way, God will win it. Question is, how do you stand strong? Take a look at this in 2 Chronicles 20. 20. Put your trust in the Lord your God and you will be established, but your trust... Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. 
Will you circle the word succeed? Still, as Pastor Emeritus, every Tuesday I get with my prayer group and we pray that you will stand, that you will not run, that you will stand strong and you will wait and see what God does. And how does this happen? Folks, it's as you and I trust in the character of God that we understand through the scriptures. And as we are in the word, trusting who we discover in God's word, our hope rises. The fourth step is this, is you thank God in advance for the answer. And it is an unusual plan. And yet I think this story perfectly illustrates the importance of thanking God in advance before you get the answers. Take a look at verse 21. Then the king appointed musicians and singers in choir robes to march in front of the army and loudly praise and thank the Lord. This is what they sang. We thank God. His love never quits. God told him, I want you to start singing. I want you to sing your praises of thanks to God. Thank you, God. Thank you. Your love never ends. That's why they don't have me up here on the worship team. But it is a joyful noise when you sing your thanks to God. It would be like the king coming to Scott and the worship team and saying, hey, I want you to get out front and I want you to sing praises of thanks to God. Look at this. Verse 22, at, at the moment they began to sing and to praise the, at the moment that they began to sing and to praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to begin fighting among themselves and they destroyed each other. I mean, how cool is that? They win the battle through giving thanks and no doubt when they, they first came out with Scott and the band and the worship team out front, it confused the enemy so much that they turned on themselves and they won the battle without raising a sword. So I have two questions. When are you going to start thanking God for the promises that he's already given you for your uncontrollable situation? When are you going to start thanking God now? And secondly, when are you going to make worship a priority so as to get your heart in line with the miracle that he wants to do? Far too often we look at worship and praising and thanking God as the warm-up act for the real thing, like when Pastor George steps up here, when in reality, folks, listen to this, worship is the spark that gets God into action. In the middle of January next month, we're gonna start in the Experience God group, the book of Revelation. And it is so interesting to me before God gets into his judgments in Revelations four and chapters five is in the throne room of God. And guess what's going on? Worship. And worship sparks God into action where at least in the book, he says, okay, I'm gonna start righting the wrongs of this world. So I say again, when are you gonna start thanking God for the promises that he's already given you, that he's going to fulfill? And when are you gonna make worship a priority? The fifth and last thing is this. Take a look at 2 Chronicles 20, 24 through 26. When the army of Judah finally arrived at the battleground, the valley was covered with dead bodies for as far as they could see. No one had survived so they went out to gather the plunder and they found huge amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables. More than they could carry back. In fact, there was so much loot, it took three days to collect all, all. On the fourth day, they gathered for a worship service in that valley, which they named the Valley of Rach, because the people had thanked and praised God there. Will you write this down? Expect God to turn your battle into blessings. And how will you know that? You'll have more loot 
then you'll be able to carry back yourself. Secondly, your heart will grow in your understanding and praise of God. And thirdly, unbelievers will begin to take note. I want to read this verse. It's not in your outline, but I want to read this. Second Chronicles 20, 29. And the dread of God was on all the kingdoms of the lands when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace for his God gave him rest on all sides. Unbelievers began to take note. And that is what I believe. And I'm thanking God in advance for right now as life point moves forward into life point 2.0. That unbelievers will continue to come to know Christ right here. And unbelievers will come to know Christ there, wherever the there is at, because God's already picked it out. And the result is peace and security where our worries go down and our hope arises. Let's pray. Lord, I, I am so glad that when you were on earth in the person of Jesus, that you said nothing is impossible for God. And though we find ourselves in impossible situations, tempted to run, tempted to hide, tempted to try to do it ourselves, you have called us to wait and to trust in the God who accomplishes the impossible. And I thank you that you do that. And I thank you, God, that you're doing that right now for my wife and I. I thank you, God, that you're gonna do that for life point. I don't know where you're at this morning, but you may be in a situation where you have thought you were gonna pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and you're in a place that you just can't do that anymore. Today's your day then to trust, put your faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And you can do that just by simply saying something like this in your own heart, in your own words, but something like this, God, I admit it. I've been trying to live my life my way and it's just not working right now. But I believe that you're the answer. That you came into this world and that you died on the cross for my sins, for my mistakes, my flops, failures, and fumbles, God. And so right now, I'm committing myself to you and I'm looking to you, God, to do what I can't. And if you prayed that prayer in your own words, God heard you. You're part of his kingdom now. You're part of his family. And I'd love for you to be a part of this family. And just let us know that you've made that commitment. And if you can just take a little picture of that barcode that's in front of you on the, in the pew, you can just let us know. And we'd love to get in contact with you to help you. Or if after this service you want to talk with someone behind the black curtains in this sanctuary, you could do that as well. We'd love to help you on your journey. And so God, we give you this. We say we love you. We thank you, God, for the many blessings of the past and the opportunity that we have in our country to gather around tables and to be grateful for those things. But God, we are people of faith and we wanna thank you in advance for the promises you've given us about our futures. We look to you, you're faithful. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I hope today's message was an encouragement to you. And if you'd like a little more information about our church, just visit us on our website at lifepointplano.org.